I think understanding the patient's spiritual background is important in potentially almost any healthcare setting in which we interact with patients. The first thing is to find out how the patient feels about uh, religious interactions and whether it's important to them. If it is important, uh, then we need to delve into how those beliefs and their background can help us treat them better. I remember the first time that I met with Dr. Guarneri. He asked me questions about my faith. If you believe as human beings that we're body, mind, and spirit, why wouldn't we want to care for the spiritual? Not just how I feel, but what I'm dealing with. Whatever your needs are, he's going to try to meet them today. And as I deal with them on this level, it recharges me so I'm able to continue this as I go forward. Reaching out to the patient spiritually as well as physically and emotionally, that's good medicine, absolutely. Welcome to part three of this educational series on integrating spirituality into patient care. This video focuses on clinical applications by physicians. I begin by briefly summarizing, number one, what are we asking physicians to do? Number two, definitions of the terms I'll be using. Number three, why physicians should do a spiritual assessment. And number four, the research that justifies taking the time to do so. After this introduction, I will dive into the heart of the presentation that focuses on the how-to of integrating spirituality into patient care. In that section, I'll be covering topics such as the spiritual assessment, the minimum physician requirement, optional activities beyond the minimum, barriers to spiritual assessment, whole person needs of physicians, the role of the spiritual care team, spiritual resources for physicians, and boundaries that should not be crossed. First, what are we asking physicians to do? We are asking physicians to, number one, conduct a brief spiritual assessment consisting of three questions. Number two, identify spiritual needs related to medical illness and health care. Number three, ensure that someone meets those needs. Number four, be willing to discuss this subject with patients in a supportive manner. And number five, be aware of the health benefits of doing so. Next, what do we mean by terms such as religion and spirituality, and how is this relevant to the physician's tasks that I just listed? Most of the research that I reviewed in part two of this series, and that I'll be reviewing briefly here, has examined relationships between religious involvement and health. Religion. Religion involves beliefs and practices related to the transcendent. Religions usually have rules to guide behavior here on earth and doctrines about life after death. Religion is often organized as a community, but it can also exist outside of an institution and may be practiced alone and in private. So religion doesn't always have to involve attending church, synagogue, or mosque, but can also involve private expressions of devotion to the transcendent. Private expressions might include such activities as prayer or meditation, reading holy scriptures, watching religious TV or listening to religious programs or music on the radio. When it comes to doing research, religion is relatively easy to measure and quantify. This is why most of the research that I reviewed in part two and will be summarizing here examined relationships between religious involvement and health. However, religion can also be divisive since people believe different things and believe them passionately. Furthermore, pluralistic healthcare settings will likely involve patients and providers from a number of different religions, and everyone must respect each other's beliefs. Therefore, the term spirituality has arisen. Spirituality provides a universal language that patients are allowed to define for themselves. Spirituality for many patients will be their religious beliefs and practices. For others, it may not involve religion at all, 
although will likely involve something close to it. Therefore, physicians should communicate with patients using the term spiritual or spirituality and allow the patient to define whatever that means to him or her. So that's it for definitions. Now, why should physicians do a spiritual assessment? First, many patients have spiritual needs that influence satisfaction with care and can have a dramatic effect on health care costs, especially toward the end of life. Number two, religious beliefs influence coping with illness and may affect the patient's emotional state and motivation towards recovery. Number three, religion affects important health-related behaviors and likely influences medical outcomes. Number four, religious beliefs influence medical decisions made by both patients and physicians. Number five, the standards of care require that providers respect patients' cultural and spiritual beliefs, and assessment is the only way to know what those beliefs are. Number six, Involvement in a religious community may influence health by increasing patient monitoring and thereby improving treatment compliance. Finally, addressing spiritual issues may benefit the physician by providing intrinsic rewards associated with practicing whole person health care. There is also scientific rationale for assessing and addressing patient spiritual needs. I will quickly review some of that research here. However, for a more detailed examination of these studies, viewers are encouraged to watch part two in this educational series. I begin with mental health and then move on to social health, health behaviors, and physical health. In some areas of the United States and elsewhere in the world, up to 90% of medical patients use religion to cope. Research indicates that the overwhelming majority of these patients report that religion helps them. Religious beliefs are commonly used to endure the distress caused by health problems. Religious beliefs give meaning to illness, promote hope for recovery, and provide behaviors that make the individual feel more in control, such as prayer. Beliefs of this kind have been repeatedly linked with better mental health in medical patients. How, though, is religion related to health more generally? With regard to mental and social health, religious involvement is related to less depression in over 60% of 444 quantitative studies, greater well-being and happiness in nearly 80% of over 300 studies, greater meaning and purpose in over 90% of studies, greater hope and optimism in over 75% of over 70 studies. Because they convey greater meaning, purpose, and hope, religious beliefs and activities are related to less suicide, fewer suicidal attempts, and more negative attitudes towards suicide in 75% of over 140 studies. Religious involvement is also related to less alcohol and drug use or abuse in over 85% of nearly 300 studies, and greater social support, greater marital stability, and more pro-social behaviors in more than 80% of over 250 studies. What about health behaviors, such as exercise, diet, cigarette smoking, sexual activity, and weight control? These behaviors are responsible for nearly 80% of all chronic medical illness. The research shows that religious persons are more likely to exercise or be physically active in nearly 70% of more than three dozen studies, eat a better diet in over 60% of nearly two dozen studies, have lower cholesterol in over 50% of studies, participate in less extramarital sex in over 85% of nearly 100 studies, and less likely to smoke cigarettes in 90% of over 130 studies. Unfortunately, the more religious had lower weight in only 20% of studies and were heavier than non-religious persons in 40% of studies. Despite being heavier on average, though, 
religious persons have better physical health than non-religious persons in the majority of studies so far. This includes better immune function in over 50% of two dozen studies, better endocrine function in nearly 75% of 31 studies, better cardiovascular functions in close to 70% of two dozen studies, less coronary heart disease in nearly two-thirds of nearly 20 studies, lower blood pressure in nearly 60% of 63 studies, less cancer or a better prognosis in more than half of two dozen studies, and greater longevity overall in 68% of over 120 studies, including over 75% of the best designed studies. Finally, research indicates that spiritual needs are widespread among medical patients and when these needs are not addressed by the medical team, this reduces the patient's quality of life and satisfaction with care and can double or triple health care costs. Furthermore, randomized clinical trials show that when physicians conduct a spiritual assessment, this results in a better doctor-patient relationship, better compliance with clinic visits, lower depression in the patient, and a greater functional well-being. Based on this systematic review of the research, we conclude the following. Number one, religion is often used to cope with stress in general and medical illness in particular. Number two, religious or spiritual involvement is associated with greater well-being, less emotional disorder, less substance abuse, greater social support, and better health behaviors. Number three, religiosity is related to less physical illness, better medical outcomes, and greater longevity overall. Number four, spiritual needs are widespread in medical settings especially in patients with serious or life-threatening disease. Number five, assessing and addressing patient spiritual needs is related to greater satisfaction with care, better quality of life, less depression, fewer unnecessary health services, better functioning, and a better doctor-patient relationship. Number six, more research is needed to better understand relationships between religion and health, determine the underlying biological mechanisms involved, and develop new interventions that harness these effects. Finally, given the results of the research already done, there is every reason for physicians to begin to integrate spirituality into patient care. The spiritual assessment involves asking a few simple questions to identify spiritual needs related to medical illness. The purpose of the spiritual assessment done by the physician is to number one, make the physician aware of the patient's religious background. Number two, determine if the patient has religious or spiritual support. Number three, identify beliefs that might influence medical decisions and affect compliance with medical care. Number four, identify unmet spiritual needs related to medical illness. Number five, determine if engagement of the spiritual care team is necessary. And number six, create an atmosphere where the patient feels comfortable talking with their physician about spiritual needs affecting medical care. Assuming the receptionist or ward clerk has recorded the patient's religious affiliation in the chart, and the physician has access to this information, the spiritual assessment consists of three questions. Number one, do you have a religious or spiritual support system to help you in times of need? Number two, do you have any religious beliefs that might influence your medical decisions? Number three, do you have any other spiritual concerns that you would like someone to address? When asking these questions, the physician should verbally and non-verbally show respect for the religious or spiritual beliefs of patients, regardless of what those beliefs are. This also involves showing respect for the absence of such beliefs. Addressing patients' spiritual needs is easier than you think. 
I've been doing spiritual assessments for some time now, and I found that it gives me a lot of information about the individual, and it has great benefit to the patient. Do you have a faith-based support system to help you in times of need? Yes. Knowing their religiosity or spirituality gets to the essence of who they are. Do you have any religious beliefs that might influence your medical decisions? No. You just have to meet them where they're at, and if they don't want you to reach out to them spiritually, then you have to respect that. Do you have any other spiritual concerns you'd like someone to address? And just asking the question and being open to dialogue is the first step. How did this three-question spiritual assessment come about? The assessment was developed in response to the need for a brief evaluation that targeted practical information that physicians need to practice whole person medicine. First, given the role that religion or spirituality plays in coping with illness, the physician needs to know if the patient has support in this area. If not, then the patient may be at risk for social isolation or for lack of community monitoring, and so other resources of support should be identified. Second, given the research that shows patients' medical decisions are often based on their religious beliefs, physicians need to know about this. Research also shows that the religious beliefs of physicians affect their own medical decisions, such as prescribing medication for pain control, prescribing birth control pills, and referring patients for procedures such as abortion. Third, given that unmet spiritual needs can adversely affect quality of life and health care cost, a question is needed that identifies spiritual needs related to medical illness. Five questions were initially chosen to make up the spiritual assessment. These were published in JAMA in 2002. In order to minimize physician time and increase compliance, these questions were edited and shortened from five to three to arrive at the minimum questions necessary. I think taking the spiritual history is important in all patients in all settings. These kind of questions may not be hard science based, but they certainly establish a bond with your patient and uh, it, it definitely helps you understand better how they cope and what their preferences might want to be. Next, not all patients need a spiritual assessment by the physician. Only certain types of patients need it, such as, number one, patients with serious life-threatening conditions. Number two, patients with chronic disabling medical illness. Number three, patients with depression or significant anxiety. Number four, patients being admitted to the hospital or a nursing home. And number five, patients being seen for a well patient exam when there is time to assess social issues. Who doesn't need a spiritual assessment? Number one, patients being seen for a specific acute problem without long-term complications. Number two, patients being seen for follow-up of a specific acute problem without significant disability or coping issues. Number three, children, teenagers or young adults without a chronic illness, life-threatening condition, or coping problems. And number four, patients who have made it clear that they are not religious or spiritual, and so this topic is not relevant to them. What then does the physician do with the information gathered during a spiritual assessment? The physician should first document the patient's responses in the electronic medical record along with any comments. Those comments are particularly important. If spiritual needs are identified, a member of the spiritual care team should be alerted so that arrangements can be made to address those needs. Finally, there must be some kind of follow-up later on to ensure that spiritual needs have been adequately addressed. Although the spiritual care team may assist in this regard, it is the physician who must ensure that such follow-up occurs. So, you may be thinking, what is the least amount that I can do as a physician and still address this area competently? Number one, 
Conduct the three question spiritual assessment in patients with challenging illnesses that require coping, as I described earlier. Number two, document patients' responses in the electronic medical record. Number three, alert the spiritual care team if spiritual needs are identified. And follow up to ensure that spiritual needs are met. As I said earlier, the spiritual care team can help with this, but the physician must ensure that it happens. The spiritual assessment is not a one-time event. Whenever there is a significant change in the patient's condition, the physician will want to check whether any new spiritual needs have arisen that the patient needs help with. I think what we can't forget is that at the bedside, at the patient-physician interaction, that the humanistic aspects of medicine end up being the dominant force here. It's the ability to communicate effectively with patients, the ability to uh, find out what's really on a patient's mind, uh, find out what's troubling them, why they uh, feel the way they do, that ultimately allows us to use the science of medicine more effectively in actually treating patients. I think in general patients uh, receive questions about their spiritual background and religious backgrounds quite well. They, they seem not to be offended by this. There's a lot of data that suggests, first of all, the great majority of Americans at least uh, do believe that religion and spirituality is important to them. And most of those believe that having their physician know about it would be to everyone's advantage. In general, they help us understand the patient better, help us communicate better with the patient on the patient's own level. And understanding what's important to the patient is really vital in us uh, planning their health care. Without having that interaction, all the science in the world won't produce effective patient care. What else might physicians do? You may find that doing the spiritual assessment is actually quite rewarding and may wish to do more. Beyond the minimum requirement, what are some other activities? Here are a few. Number one, listen. Listen to and try to understand the patient's spiritual concerns. This involves taking the time to sit with the patient and just let them talk, not advise or try to find solutions. Number two, support. Support the patient's religious or spiritual beliefs, even if beliefs appear to conflict with the medical care plan. Such support will always pay off in the end. The payoff is a better doctor-patient relationship and better compliance. Number three, pray for or with the patient. Praying for the patient during the physician's own time requires no consent. However, praying with the patient does require consent and should not be done unless the patient initiates the request for prayer. If the patient requests it, and if the physician feels comfortable with it, the physician should then ask what the patient wants prayer for. With that information, it is now appropriate for either the physician or the patient to say a brief 30-second prayer that is comforting and addresses whatever the patient wishes. Number four, accommodate. In acute hospital or inpatient settings, accommodate the environment to meet the patient's spiritual needs. This may involve providing a prayer rug to a Muslim patient or arranging for a priest to deliver Holy Communion to a Catholic patient. Number five, finally, provide spiritual care to the patient. What exactly does that mean? Up until now, I've been talking about spiritual assessment and addressing of spiritual needs of patients. However, I've not yet addressed the issue of spiritual care. So here goes. Although assessing and addressing spiritual needs is part of it, spiritual care goes far beyond that and takes no extra time. The way that ordinary health care is provided by the physician can be spiritual. By that I mean recognizing the sacred nature of the person being cared for and the holy obligation and privilege that physicians have. More specifically, this means, number one, providing care with respect for the individual patient, a person with a unique life story. 
Number two, inquiring about how the patient wishes to be cared for, rather than providing the same care in the same way to everyone. Number three, providing care in a kind and gentle manner, even to difficult patients. Number four, providing care in a competent manner. And finally, number five, taking extra time with patients who really need it. Spiritual care is the heart of what whole person care is really about and has the potential to bring vitality back into the patient and into the practice of medicine. However, it is not easy to do. Indeed, there are many barriers that prevent the delivery of spiritual care. Research indicates that only about 10% of physicians conduct a spiritual assessment. Why is this so? The following are 10 barriers that stand in the way of spiritual care. These barriers are based on research by the Harvard Oncology Group at the Dana-Farber Institute. They asked oncologists and oncology nurses why they did not routinely assess and address the spiritual needs of patients. Here is how they responded. After each barrier, I will suggest how to overcome it. Number one, lack of time. A spiritual assessment is just one more thing that physicians are now being asked to do. We barely have enough time to perform our medical duties and document the results. Asking such questions could open Pandora's box. There is great temptation then to eliminate this, quote, optional activity. Response. Doing a brief spiritual assessment must be a priority. It is not optional, but central to providing whole person medical care. The spiritual assessment can often save time in the long run, improve the doctor-patient relationship, and make the practice of medicine more rewarding. Number two, discomfort. Many physicians are not comfortable addressing this topic, particularly if the physician is not religious him or herself. Few physicians have training on how to address this topic in a sensible and timely manner. Lacking expertise in this area, they don't feel comfortable asking questions about spirituality and don't know what to do about spiritual needs that are identified. Response: Comfort comes with training and practice. This is why we are having this training session, and it's up to you to practice what you learn here. Number three. Fear of making the patient uncomfortable or not knowing what to say if the patient asks, why are you asking these questions? Response: Systematic research indicates that most patients are not offended or made uncomfortable when the physician performs a spiritual assessment, and in fact the majority is often quite pleased that the physician is doing so. If a patient asks why these questions are being asked, an appropriate response would be, we are doing this routinely as a show of respect for the beliefs and values of patients, which may influence their medical care. Number four, spirituality is not important to the physician personally and is afraid that the patient will ask about his or her own beliefs. Response, first, patients seldom ask physicians about their personal beliefs. If they do ask, then a brief or general response usually satisfies the patient. The reason why most patients ask is worry about how the physician will treat their beliefs. Reassuring the patient that their beliefs will always be respected and honored usually allays this concern. Number five, this topic is too personal or there is no private space to discuss these issues. Response, physicians deal with sensitive areas related to health much more personal than asking about religious beliefs. Examples of sensitive areas include sexual behavior or personal health habits such as smoking, drinking, diet, or weight control. Fear that these areas are too personal does not prevent the physician from thoroughly assessing them. Number six, the belief that spiritual assessment is done better by others. Response, the physician is the leader of the healthcare team and needs to know about factors that could affect the patient's health and their compliance with the medical care plan. Spirituality is one of them. Number seven, the belief that patients don't want the physician to address these issues. 
response. Patient surveys indicate that only a minority of patients show resistance to such inquiry and prefer to keep medicine and religion separate, not more than about 25 percent. Number eight, concern that the power inequality between patient and physician might lead to coercion. Response, realize that coercion in this area is a violation of civil rights and so is never appropriate. I will discuss this boundary issue further in the next section. Number nine, religious beliefs of the physician differ from those of the patient. Response, realize that in this era of patient-centered medicine, the focus should be on respecting and supporting the spiritual beliefs of the patient, whether or not the physician agrees with those beliefs. Number 10, spiritual assessment is not part of the physician's role. Response, realize that providing whole person care is part of the physician's role and whole person care involves addressing this area. To provide whole person care, however, the physician has to be whole him or herself. Physicians have needs too, physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. Let me review these briefly. Number one, physical needs. These include the need for regular exercise, a healthy diet, controlling weight, regular medical checkups, and limitation of alcohol use, and time for rest and relaxation. Emotional needs. These involve the ability to comfortably handle the anxiety and stress that go along with providing health care in a high pressure environment. In particular, physicians need to be able to cope with the death of patients and the inability to cure a patient's disease. They need to be able to empathize with patients and not be afraid of caring for them. And physicians need to see purpose and meaning in the work that they do. Number three, social needs. These include spending time with spouse and children, time with friends and colleagues outside of work, and time spent in supportive interactions with colleagues during work. And finally, number four, spiritual needs. I will talk about those in a minute. When the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of physicians are not met, the ability to provide whole person compassionate care will suffer, and they will forget what is really important in the work that they do. This is perhaps the number one reason why many physicians are not assessing and addressing patient spiritual needs. The physician is not alone in assessing and addressing spiritual needs. He or she is surrounded by a spiritual care team to help address spiritual needs that come up during the spiritual assessment. The spiritual care team is made up of nurses, social workers, chaplains, and office staff and should be fully utilized. A primary purpose of the spiritual care team is to minimize physician time spent on this topic. As the leader of the spiritual care team, the physician's job is to do the spiritual assessment, which he or she cannot hand off to other team members. Physicians have very little time and may have limited emotional and spiritual reserves. Therefore, they need assistance and support in providing whole person medical care. Each member of the spiritual care team has a specific role to play. What are the roles of each member of the spiritual care team? Number one, the physician conducts the spiritual assessment, documents the results, and ensures that the spiritual needs are met by someone. Next is the spiritual care coordinator, who obtains information from the physician's assessment, coordinates the addressing of spiritual needs, prepares the patient for pastoral care referral, and provides spiritual support to other team members. The chaplain or pastoral counselor addresses the spiritual needs of the patient, provides feedback to the spiritual care team, provides spiritual support to other team members, works with the social worker, if available, to develop a spiritual care plan, 
and follows up to ensure that the patient's spiritual needs are met. Number four, in hospital settings, the social worker works with the chaplain to develop a spiritual care plan for implementation after hospital discharge and helps with follow-up to ensure that spiritual needs are met. Number five, the receptionist or other clinic or hospital staff is to ensure that the patient's religious affiliation is recorded in the electronic medical record and is available to the physician. As a member of our spiritual care team, my role as a physician is first of all to engage the patient, make them feel comfortable, so they will be able to open up about their spiritual needs and beliefs. There are times when they don't have support and they need support and they don't know where to turn. So our spiritual care team allows me to connect them with my MA who is our spiritual care coordinator and if needed to a chaplain at the hospital. This network that we have formed has allowed us to meet the spiritual needs of patients that we did not have the manpower or time to do in the past. Well, you know, days get busy. We have a lot of patients to see and sometimes we have to move on to the next patient. And so in reality, we have to work as a team and I'm thankful that I have a team to fall back on. The spiritual care team has been proven to have benefits to patients. There's quite a bit of data saying that this is important in terms of healing, it's important in terms of patient care, and therefore we should really incorporate it into our practice. An important part of the work that we do together as a team is to have a monthly meeting. I like to think of it as a spiritual care team huddle. That gives us a time to talk about patients that have been referred through the system, to know that they have followed up, to take care of any concerns that are ongoing, and to know that, in fact, patients are being taken care of. The success of the spiritual care team depends on the availability and use of spiritual resources. Physicians may choose to develop their own spiritual resources through a variety of activities. These include quiet time spent in prayer or meditation reading scripture or other inspirational literature, or participating in a faith community. For example, meditation, prayer, or practicing the presence of God may help the physician to achieve a relaxed, open state that fosters compassion, increases energy, and enables him or her to provide whole person care to patients. Several forms of meditation exist, although the form a physician chooses will depend on their faith tradition. For Buddhist physicians, mindfulness meditation may be chosen. For Hindu physicians, there is transcendental meditation, which is often combined with yoga. There are also many forms of meditation for Christian, Jewish, and Muslim physicians. For the Christian physician, there's a book by James Finley, a former Trappist monk and student of Thomas Merton, called Christian Meditation, Experiencing the Presence of God. There are also a variety of inspirational books that can be used to develop the Christian physician's spiritual life. These include The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, My Upmost for His Highest by World War I Chaplain Oswald Chambers, and Closer Than a Brother by Brother Lawrence, a 16th century monk. Several forms of meditation for Jewish physicians are also available. These are described in two books by Aria Kaplan titled Jewish Meditation, A Practical Guide, and Meditation and Kabbalah. Ray Shagaloff also has written a book called The Secret Art of Talking to God. These books and their publishers are displayed here. There are also many forms of Muslim meditation. A ritualistic prayer called Salat can be considered a meditation. Any short phrases or prayers recited silently or aloud while counting on a string of beads or knotted cord can be considered meditation because the focus is on God. For example, meditation could involve reciting and thinking about the meaning of the saying Subhan Allah or Glorious is God. Islamic meditations are also described in the book Sufi Meditations by Ibn Atta Allah and in Sufi Meditation and Contemplation by Scott Kugel. These books and their publishers are displayed here.
It's now time to describe the boundaries that physicians should seldom cross. Problems occur when the physician does more than is sensible or ethically justifiable in this area. Here are five don'ts, most of which are pretty obvious. Number one, don't prescribe religion to non-religious patients. The physician may think if religion is good for health, maybe non-believers should be encouraged to become religious. Not a good idea. Number two, don't force a spiritual assessment if the patient is not religious. In that case, quickly switch to ask about what gives life meaning and purpose in the context of illness and how this can be supported. Number three, don't pray with the patient before doing a spiritual assessment and unless the patient asks or be ready for a lawsuit. While more than two-thirds to three-quarters of patients would like to pray with their physician and deeply appreciate the offer, others do not. Number four, don't spiritually counsel patients. Instead, always refer to trained professional chaplains or pastoral counselors. The only exceptions might be if the physician has pastoral care training or if addressing spiritual issues is urgent and the patient refuses pastoral care or pastoral care is not available. Number five, don't do any activity that is not patient-centered and patient-directed. Remember, it's about the patient, not the physician. Firsthand, I've been able to experience the benefits that introducing this type of care into the practice gives to my patients and to myself. That opportunity brings meaning to the job. It gives a sense of fulfillment for many of the things that we went into medicine for. We know that you have the knowledge. We just need to know that in your heart that you really want to help us. He asked those questions and I just was able to open up. I will not forget that day. It's that aspect of care that you can't touch, but you know that's there. In conclusion then, number one, there are many reasons why physicians should identify and address spiritual needs related to medical illness. Number two, research, common sense, and good clinical practice justify taking the time to do so. Number three, the physician is responsible for doing the spiritual assessment. Number four, the physician may choose to integrate spirituality into patient care in other ways as well. Number five, the physician is responsible but not alone and is backed up by a spiritual care team. And number six, there are spiritual resources available to support the physician and the spiritual care team. For physicians who are wondering how they can really reestablish that patient-physician bond and get back to the true heart of medicine, I don't think it's all that hard. I think you just have to remember first and foremost the patient's a person and the physician's a person. And what we're dealing with is just trying to reestablish person-to-person contact and relationships. And it's all about relationships. Physicians should feel at ease to talk with patients about things that interest both of them. Uh, I always like finding a common bond between me and a patient. Uh, if we both happen to like basketball, we'll talk a little bit about basketball. A minute or so of a discussion around a common interest can often go miles in producing effective relationships. Really think about how you as an individual can most effectively establish relationships with your patients because it'll pay off in the end both in satisfaction of dealing with the patients and in the satisfaction of being able to actually make a difference in their medical care and ultimately in their lives. For more information on how to assess and address the spiritual needs of patients, I suggest the book Spirituality in Patient Care, third edition. There is also a lot of information available on our website at spiritualityandhealth.duke.edu.